Hello, and welcome to another edition of First Baptist Church International Standard Sunday School Lesson. That's First Baptist Church of Elizabethtown, Kentucky, and our pastor is the Dr. Roderick Jones. And we're so glad that you're with us today. And if you're watching us on Facebook, please like and share. If you're on YouTube, we pray that uh, you are a subscriber. And if not, please subscribe and like our page. And now we will pray. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, you're just so good. You're a King of kings. You're our Lord of lords. You're our everything. You're all that we need. And dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray that this word that goes forth will be instilled and inspired totally by your Holy Spirit, that he will have his own way in our midst, not only as I give forth, but also as those who receive, Lord, they give understanding in Jesus' name, Lord. Let it be all of you, none of me, O oh God. I don't have any wisdom of my own. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you're my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. This week's overall title is Heir of God. And our adult topic is free to live a mature life. We're talking about inheriting all the promises that God has for us. And if we are able to inherit those promises that God is holding out for us, then we can live to be mature Christians and live, live a good and a free life of maturity. We're in the fall quarter still and it's God's law is love and we know that love covers a multitude of sin we know that if we love one another we're not going to hurt one another we're not going to do anything wrong to another we're going to wish the best for each other unit two fall faith triumphs and law fails faith triumphs and law fails and our print passage today is from Galatians third chapter the 23rd through 29th verse and it rolls over to the fourth chapter the first through the seventh verse and our lesson today is for October the 29th 2023 now today's lesson is a continuation of and a deeper explanation of last week's lesson as we continue our studies in Galatians, the third chapter, Galatia we, uh, was a Roman province located in modern-day Turkey. And Paul had established his churches in the region. In his letter to the churches of Galatia, the Apostle Paul, just like a skilled lawyer, laid out the case that salvation cannot be achieved through the law of Moses, but by faith, in Christ Jesus alone. Now, as we mentioned uh, last week, there were a group of Judaizers, and Judaizers were Christians who had accepted Christ as their Savior. Uh, they were the Jewish uh, nation, but they were holding on to those old Jewish laws that were no longer in effect, okay? And they were teaching that keeping the law of Moses was necessary for salvation. Some of the Galatian Christians had fallen victim to and had become a bondage to this false teaching. Therefore, God inspired the Apostle Paul to write the letter, to liberate the minds of the Galatian Christians, and to dispel erroneous teaching. We Christians today must be mindful that we must be guided by Holy Spirit as we study meditate, and as we proclaim the word of God, we must move beyond the traditions of man and our own personal beliefs to discover God's truth. What does God really want me to know? What is God really saying? What is his original intent? The churches of Galatia, as well as the entire early church, was made up of both Jews and Gentiles. Of course, Jews are descendant from Israel, whose uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel by God, and all his descendants are, are considered Jews and Gentiles. So, Gentiles are anybody who's not a Jew. So, they were saved out of various cultures, 
and various traditions and beliefs. And as they converted to Christianity, it meant change. Change is not always easy. Putting aside cultural norms, letting go of traditions, casting away false beliefs is all part of being willing to be transformed by the word of God and desiring to be guided by his spirit. A person must want to change before a change is made. Before his conversion, Paul thought he was doing God a favor when he went around persecuting Christians. He believed that Christians threatened Jewish traditions, practices, prominence, and power. But when Paul had a blinding encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and a Christian layman named Ananias, Ananias wasn't a deacon, he wasn't a pastor, he wasn't an apostle, he wasn't a prophet, he wasn't an evangelist teacher, he was just a regular Christian. <laughs> And God told him to go to Paul, then his name was Saul, and lay hands on him. And he laid hands on him. And he was Holy Spirit baptized, plus he received his sight both physically and spiritually. Paul was then willing to change. He was willing to change because he accepted the fact that he'd been wrong. See, unless we accept the fact we're wrong, we're not going to change. And th that experience changed the trajectory of his entire life. Now, Paul is writing to the Galatian churches to keep them from walking in error as he had blindly done. Now, before we get to our print passage, we're going to start where we left off last week. Last week, we left off in the third chapter, in the 14th verse. So we're going to start with the 15th verse. And we're going to be using, in this introductory passage, the God's Word uh, paraphrase. Because uh, it's a little plainer, and but it is relevant to our print passage. And as I had stated before, Paul presented his explanation and uh in teaching them and reiterating to them that faith in Christ alone is the way we get saved. He, he's laying out his case, and this is a part of his case. And so I'm, I'm including this in our lesson today, but I'm using the God's Word translation, or actually a paraphrase, so that uh, we won't have a whole lot of time trying to explain it, okay? All right. Now, 15th verse. Brothers and sisters, let me use an example from everyday life no one can cancel a person's will or add conditions to it once that it is put into effect. That was the way it was then, and that's the way it is now. A person writes a will, and they die. And when they die, that will goes into effect. Nobody can change it. And that's the way it was back then. So he's making this comparison. So he goes on and he says, The promises were spoken to Abraham, and to his descendant. Scripture doesn't say descendants, referring to many, but your descendant, referring to one. That descendant is Christ. So he's saying, now God made this promise. It's, it's, it's like a will, a binding will. When God says he's going to do something, when God promises, it's binding. And so he made this promise to Abraham that through his descendant, who is Christ, all nations will be blessed. And there are all of the promises that he gave Abraham, all the promises that God had given to humanity belongs to those who believe in Christ. So 17th verse, it says, This is what I mean. The laws given to Moses... 430 years after God had already put his promise to Abraham into the effect, didn't cancel the promise to Abraham. If we have to gain the inheritance by following those laws, then it no longer comes to us because of the promise. However, God freely gave the inheritance to Abraham through a promise. He's saying, 
430 years after God gave Abraham the promise that he was going to uh, be the progenitor of someone who's going to save the whole world, that then that did not negate the promise that God gave to Abraham. It did not negate it at all. He's saying that that promise or that will is still in effect. So he said, so he said, if we gain the inheritance by following the law, then it no longer becomes uh, because of the promise. However, God freely gave the inheritance to Abraham through a promise. If it's the law, we can be saved. If we can receive the promises of God through the law, then we didn't need Jesus Christ. He wasted his time coming. He wasted his time being born of a virgin. He wasted his time being uh dying for our stead. He wasted his time going to hell and being raised up from the grave. If the law could save us, 19th verse, what then is the promise, purpose of the laws given to Moses? So he's, he's anticipating them asking this question. Okay, well, so if the, the law is not going to save us, then what's the purpose of the law? And then he says, they were added to identify what wrongdoing is. You see, before the law, the will of God and, and the intentions of God was handed down orally over generation generations. And it wasn't written. It was an oral tradition. And you know, when something's handed down orally, a lot of times after, after a while, it doesn't come out the way it was originally. But... God made his promises to Abraham but 430 years later because there was so much sin in the world he had it he had the law written so people will know what's right and what's wrong and he also set up sacrifices now they did sacrifices before Abraham did sacrifices but he set out rules for sacrifices and these rules patterned or sort of foreshadowed the suffering Savior, Jesus Christ, who's going to die or be our final sacrifice. And so he said they were added to identify our wrongdoing so that people would know what's right and what is wrong. Moses' law did this until the descendant, who was Jesus Christ, to whom the promise was given came. So until he came, then there's no more sacrifices, no need circumcision, certain foods we don't have to refrain from eating, all of the different things that Mosaic law forbid. Moses' laws did this until the descendant to whom the promise was given came. It was put into effect through angels using a mediator. So until Jesus came and until his death, burial, and resurrection, the law was in effect. But when Jesus accomplished his mission in dying and saving us from our sin and paying our sin debt and being the final sacrifice, then there was no need to seek the law for salvation. He, and it was put into effect through angels using a mediator. Abraham spoke directly with God. God made the promise, it was binding, and it was made directly to Abraham. The law did not annul it. The Abraham, the promises to Abraham were still in effect. However, because of our sin, we weren't able to reap them. So, that's why Jesus came. And when Jesus came, and he fulfilled our sin debt, paid our sin debt for us, then we we were able to have eternal life through him. Now, when the law was given to Moses, was given through an angel to Moses, and he wrote it, and he gave it to the people. So a mediator is someone who comes between someone. So God gave the law, but it it didn't come directly from him, even though it was his law, and everything he gave was what he intended. So he didn't 
because but when it comes in me directly from that person then it has greater weight than that which comes as a mediator no mediator was needed for uh for the promises that god gave to abraham but moses had to tell the people what god said because they didn't hear what god said they didn't know what god said Moses had to be the mediator between the people and God. Okay, so a mediator is not used when there's only one person involved and God has acted on his own. God acted on his own with Abraham. Now, does this mean then that the laws given to Moses contradict God's promises? And he says, that's unthinkable. Absolutely not. There's no way in the world that God's promises would contradict the word of God. God does not contradict himself. He said, if those laws could give us life, then certainly we would receive God's approval because he obeyed, we obeyed them. If, if those words gave us life, then by obeying them, we, we have eternal life. But guess what? We couldn't obey them because we didn't have his spirit. Because when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God withdrew his spirit. We became all, everybody born was born spiritually dead, born in sin, shapen in iniquity. And the best we tried to, to keep the law because of that flesh, always that flesh rose up and we succumbed to the flesh and sin. So that cause us to be guilty. That's why God had to introduce sacrifices as, as symbolic to shed blood of animals in place to uh, in place of uh, to satisfy the payment for our sin. So those laws they 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 weren't good enough, but they were temporary. And so it's unthinkable that God's promises contradicts God's law and it doesn't but scripture states that the whole world is controlled by the power of sin and that's it therefore a promise based on faith in Jesus Christ could be given to those who believe those who believe in Jesus Christ's redemptive message his redemptive work on Calvary how he died in our place, how he went to hell, why he rose from the grave, alive forevermore, ascended to his Father, sent us back his Holy Spirit. And that's the key. You see, back in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon certain kings, prophets, judges, and sometimes certain other people so as needed. And most of the time, they're like a Levite. Came upon them. But now, after the day of Pentecost, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. Jesus died to save us from our sins. He sent us the Holy Spirit to save us from ourselves, to save us from that old flesh nature. So now we have the capacity to obey God. And if we're really saved, if we really love the Lord, if he's, if he's really the head of our life, we want to please him, and we please him by doing that what he pleases him, by following his word. Now, none of us are perfect. And there are times we might have temporary insanity and sin. But we have an advocate with the Father. We repent and really feel that means we've, we, we're, we're sorrow sorry for what we've done and we turn from it that's what repentance is it doesn't mean you go back doing it again God does not have cheap grace that means we have the attitude that oh I can do anything I want to God forgive me well yeah he will forgive us of anything but not with that attitude because it's we if we love the Lord, we don't want to. We don't want to displease Him by sinning. We don't. We don't want to. Uh, we want to please Him, and by pleasing Him, we do that which He requires in His Word. Okay. So the whole world. 
was controlled by the power of sin. Still is, except God has all power. Therefore, a promise based on faith in Jesus Christ could be given to those who believe. If we're a believer, the promises of Abraham are ours. Now we get to our print passage. And uh, this was, uh, the law was like a preparatory to the dispensation of Christ. Look at the 23rd verse. It says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterward be revealed. He said, we were, we were under law. Uh, can't have faith in the law because faith didn't work. But it was a foreshadowing. It was, it, was, uh, a, it was before the promise that God had promised Abraham to come, and that was Christ Jesus. 24th verse, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. In those days, rich people, they had schoolmasters for their children. They were sometimes learned uh, slaves who had been well educated, or just they hired people to uh, to educate them, to discipline them, to teach them moral codes, to help them mature, to give them life skills. And for the Jewish people, they would uh, teach them. Uh, they'd take them to the Jewish school where they would learn the Torah, and. Uh, they would basically groom them for maturity so when they became of an age then they would be able to be go on themselves and live their lives but that was temporary that was only until they got to the place that they were no longer a child and they could move on with their life because they'd been trained now, that's what he compares the law with. It was temporary until Jesus came. And so, it was our schoolmaster until Jesus came. And now, we're one in Christ. 26 verse, For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Remember, he's talking to the church. You're, if you haven't made Jesus Lord of your life, no, you're not his child. You're his creation. We're his children when we make Jesus the Lord and boss of our life. And we become adopted. And we become heirs. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When we make Jesus the Lord of our lives, we're baptized into Christ, into his body. Now, we're talking about spiritual baptism, and we're also talking about physical baptism. Now, baptism will not save you. Some people think that being baptized is going to save you. Baptized is in obedience to Christ's command. It's a symbolic of, our, of, of what happens when we're saved. Holding our breath is like we're dying to self. When we're buried under the water, that's, that's like we're buried to sin. And then when we're raised from the, the water, it's like we're being raised in a newness of life. All the filth is washed away. And so uh, that is a commandment. It's one of the uh, ordinances of the church. But it ain't going to save you because if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, you go down a dry devil and come up a wet one. But baptized in, by his spirit, that's when the Spirit controls you. When we make Jesus the Lord of our life, the Spirit comes within us and dwells us. But when we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit controls us or baptizes us or has, has he's able, we're able to, uh, we're surrendered to him. In other words, when we get the indwelling Holy Spirit as we are saved. We have the Holy Spirit. When we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has us. It's a big difference. There's a higher level of commitment to God. There's, as he moves, we move with him. When we have the Holy Ghost, we can take him wherever we go. And we, he, he gives us an unction, tells us what to do, 
and maybe we will and maybe we won't. When he, we're controlled by the Holy Spirit, that's when he's in control. When he has us, then we do what he tells us to do. Now, which means that we have to be filled on a continual basis. That's why you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and raise all kinds of hell in the world. <laughs> because we, we're saved, but we've forgot from whence we came and not, we surrendered to our flesh rather than to the Spirit. Let's go away from that, okay? Okay, four. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. When we've made Jesus the Lord of our life, we're on the same plane, in Christ, in his body, in his church, because the body of Christ is the church. It doesn't matter what your sociological stand, standard is, what your social standard is. It doesn't matter uh, what your nationality is. It doesn't matter whether you're male or whether you're female. Whatever God has for you is for you. You can be a prophet. You can be a, an apostle. You can be an evangelist. You can be a pastor. You can be a teacher. You can be anything God has called you to be. When in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, when he says he, he ascended to the Father and he gave gifts to men, that word men is anthropos. That means mankind, male and female. So God has labeled, has, has leveled the field. Men, they're not, whatever God has in his kingdom is not just for you. It's for anybody. Male, female. It I wonder, I mean, I really I'm really amazed at how God managed to raise up a Deborah in a female judge and prophet in a patriarchal society where men ruled and women are considered as uh, property and also the, the leg legitimacy of their testimony was always in doubt unless it was witnessed by a male that in that climate God managed to raise up a woman named Deborah who was essentially the pastor of Israel she was judge and prophet and Barak the general he would not go to battle without her Throughout the Bible, God has used women. And they went up to Deborah. They went up to Deborah. And they were, Mary Magdalene was the first one to proclaim the gospel. All through the Bible, you have your older the prophetess, Anna the prophetess, Miriam's a prophetess, the, the daughters of Philip were, were, were prophets. All through the Bible, you have Phoebe the deacon, you have Junia the apostle. All through Scripture, Priscilla and her husband co pastor the church. God will use whoever he wishes because he said he would. Let's go on. 29th verse. And if ye be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if we made Jesus the Lord of our life, then that's what makes us heirs of God's promise. Not only the promise of Abraham, but anything God promises. And then it, we go over to the fourth chapter in the first verse. It says, And I say so long time as the heir is a babe, he differeth nothing from a servant, being Lord of all. So while a kid's a babe and he's under that tutorship as we was talking about, uh, he's just like a servant because he's obeying rules. Even though he's the heir of the property, he's, he's a servant because he's told what to do but is under tutors and stewards till the time appointed of the father and that is when they're mature when they're old so also we when we are babes under the elements of the world were in servitude before we made jesus christ our lord and savior we were in slavery to sin 
because the law couldn't keep us from sinning. Only the power of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit to keep us from sinning. So we become sons and heirs when we make Jesus the Lord of our life. And so the fourth verse, it says, And when the fullness of time did come, God sent forth his Son, come of a woman, come under law, that those under the law may re redeem that the adoption of sons we may receive. So God in his own time, in the fullness of time, Jesus came exactly when God intended him for come and exactly when the, the scriptures had foretold. And he came, he was born of a woman, the Holy Spirit implanted the embryo of the Christ and Mary and nine months later, as she carried the word of God, she birthed Jesus Christ. And he came, he lived and died, he, he, he exemplified God himself. He showed what love truly is. He died in our place, he arose from the grave, and he gave us his Holy Spirit. And it says, And because ye are sons, God did send forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. When we receive his Spirit inside us, when we make Jesus Lord of our life, we cry, Abba. Father. Abba means father. It's an Aramaic term that's derived from a Chaldean language. and But it means Abba, Father. It's, and, and, and in that Chaldean language or that Aramaic, it's, it's a fondness or a, a loving father. And so regardless of what kind of father you have here on earth, know this, that we have a heavenly father that loves us, will take care of us, and will do everything in his power. And he has all power to help us to become the person that he created us to be. And fifth verse, and those under law he may redeem that the adoption of sons we may receive. But see, because those under the law, under the law of Moses, those who made Jesus the Lord of their life, he redeemed and made them sons. And because you are sons, God didn't send forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, also an heir of God through Christ. So if we are his child, then we become an heir because we're his kids, <laughs> heir of every promise that God made, and he promised us eternal life with him. Jesus walked this earth, and he obeyed every one of those Mosaic laws every one of them he didn't miss a beat but we couldn't he's the only one who's able to even though the Sadducees and the Pharisees uh, accused him not of doing it but they had some extra rules that they had perverted the law of Moses essentially and so that we are not servants to sin anymore but we're sons and daughters of God inheriting all that God has promised to us and I'm going to go real quick we're going to throw in another scripture 2 Corinthians 5 21 and it reads for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him Jesus Christ became sin on our behalf all of our sin was put on him and all of his righteousness was put on us so that we might have eternal life with him. And if you've never made that decision of making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it's right now time. Believe that he died. Believe that he rose from the grave. Believe that he is alive forevermore. Ask him to forgive you of your sin. Ask him to make you the person he created you to be. And let baptize you in his Holy Spirit and let those rivers of living water flow from your lips like on the day of Pentecost and your life will never be the same. Never ever be the same in Jesus name. Amen. We'll see you next week. Amen. Amen.